good morning good afternoon good evening everyone where are you from and welcome everyone to this year's cba 16 the community based adaptation conference focusing on local solutions inspiring global action my name is Susila Pandit, and currently I am a PhD student at uh, University of Kent in UK on climate adaptation policies, uh, focusing on challenges and barriers uh, of implementation of it, uh, especially on Nepal, India, and Bhutan. I started my career as young climate activist, then a development practitioner, working on climate adaptation, disaster management, building resilience, and empowering women and girls for more than a decade now. And I'm so happy to be with you all today as your host for this opening plenary. And uh, we want to make it a little different. And as per our motto of making it a practitioner's best event, more participatory and interactive. And we hope to get uh, your support as always in this regard. Uh, towards the end of, the end of the session, we will need a pen and a marker and a piece of paper. So please arrange it uh, in the meantime and we will reveal it at the end. Uh, so be prepared not only to listen to the wonderful speakers we have today, but also speak up and share your thoughts, challenges, and ideas to this community of practitioners. So CBA this year will be focusing on putting locally-led adaptation into practice, uh, so we expect a lot of interaction, challenging the principles, asking difficult questions, and having a rich conversation, and to share, learn, and understand the practical challenges, the opportunities underlying, and the difficulties while implementing this LLA principle. Talking about LLA, the locally led adaptation, it has been grown out of the concept of community-based adaptation. As you know, this is the 16th year of Community-Based Adaptation Conference happening annually, which has led to the concept of locally-led adaptation. It initially started from the civil society sector, working with the most vulnerable people and communities, which are the first hit by climate change, the front line of the affected nations and communities. Last couple of years, we have a major development on adaptation sector, which is called the Global Commission on Adaptation, which was a two-year process that developed eight different action tracks, and one of them was the locally-led adaptation, which has led to the development of principles of locally-led adaptation. And we had a build a community of practice and get more and more organizations, donors, government, to sign and endorse these principles. And the number is growing. Uh, it's more than 125 currently, and the endorsers commit to integrating uh, the principles and joining CBA, uh, the Gobeshana, and the COP to enhance and promote locally led adaptation. And now it's time to move from adopting these principles to principles to practicing these principles. So there are eight principles for locally led adaptation, which you can see on the screen. We have two sessions uh, last year in CBA 15, focusing on, is, uh, on these eight principles. So if you want to refresh on these principles, I request you to follow the CBA 15 session recordings available on YouTube. Uh, the most exciting and of course challenging principle, I think is the number two. The structural inequalities are already existing in the communities and institutions where we are working and the changing climate is making it even worse. The differential effect of climate change and the adaptation capacity of these vulnerable groups are sometimes considered as a token or a tick box activity. Uh, the underlying cause of vulnerability are not dig down and analyzed, thus creating more power imbalance and people feeling voiceless. The other challenge in these groups is the confidence, uh, which is always lowered, uh, that the local knowledge and innovation they have and the power to take action they have is not realized by themselves, which makes them feel less powerful. So this principle is especially very challenging uh, as these underlying constraints and barriers and building confidence on inclusive locally-led adaptation. 
The another striking principle for me is uh, number five as well, as we are promoting locally led adaptation, translating the climate information and data to local level could be challenging. Uh, last year, while working on an anticipatory best action or response in flood in Nepal, we realized that the best thing we were working had not enough data points, the meteorological and hydrological stations. So we need to rely on more regional models, uh, which was not effective for the local level. Also, translating that information to local government was the another challenge. So we need to do a lot of work on practically make these principles work. You may have your favorite principles out of these eight, which you can drop on the chat box as well. So why do we need these principles? The problem we are trying to address, uh, the climate finance is not delivering in the way that support adaptation. Yes, the need for adaptation is ever greater. As we see now, it's not the future, the climate impacts and the extreme events are happening. It's already happening. And, and not even in poor and underdeveloped countries, but globally as well. So it's not, it's no more a global South issue, global South problem, but there is an opportunity to learn from the community and the countries in global South and scale it up, which is reflected through this locally led adaptation principles. We need to ensure that the funders and the implementers, implementers are actively seeking to integrate and champion this in a way that they have not done with the programs in the past. The other critical issue is maladaptation. The maladaptation happens when the principles are not taken into account. We are at the risk of making things worse. The major challenge in this is not enough consultation with local communities and understanding the local context. We have already seen that top-down decision-making does not help or even make things worse. So we have to learn from these and we will as well well while we are implementing these principles. This is the time right now to move from the principles into practice. This is because the principles based on evidence and consultation force us to do things in a way that we have not done for a long time. It forces us to change our approach and move away from being comfortable to address the inequality, partnerships, funding, planning, and collaboration. But putting principles in practice is difficult. There is no standard one size fits all, as it's not expert-led top-down approach, which has been proven does not work. So we don't have a formula, so we don't uh, so we need to work together with the local authority and the local communities and design it accordingly, which could be challenging for scaling up. Solutions that incorporate the principle will deeper and also the structural challenges undermine meaningful change. So we have this community of practitioners to share and listen. CBA is the voice of the local actors, which is based on experience, discussion, and bring together the people who are doing things on the ground. It is a platform to bring voices of most vulnerable to inform decision making at multiple levels. And the way we have a structure over it for next uh, next few years or decade is for is to have the three events uh, in a year. The first part of the year is the annual conference called Gobashana, which is a Bangla word for research to know what is research telling us about what we are learning on adaptation. During the second half, uh, the middle of the year, we will have the annual CBA conference. This will bring practitioners who are working uh, on ground, mostly the NGOs, local government, and have their voice. And the third event is the big conference, the Conference of Parties, COP, held under the UN Framework Convention towards the last, uh, towards the last or end of the year. Uh, which was uh, last year held on UK on Glasgow, and this will be this year it will be on Egypt on November, which is focused on policymakers, where the inputs from the uh, the above two events will inform and advocate to the decision makers at the COP. The voices from the front line actually feeds into the global decision making at the COP each year.
So this year, so as we have already mentioned about the CBA's 16th aim uh, on, on part of these three events, the aim for this year's CBA is to see what works and what does not. So putting the principles into practice and what are the challenges to applying the principles? What do we need to know when applying them in different places? Uh, this year, we also have this objective of building our network and to expand our community of practice to, do, uh, to those who need to be a part of it. So I request everyone to challenge each other uh, because we already have this principle and this is not something written on a stone. We have to work on it. We have to develop it further and we have to challenge it. And challenging is writing, uh, asking the right question and discussing so that we have uh, a lot of uh, fruitful conversation and a uh, way out uh, through these two days in the in this CBA. Uh, as I mentioned al already, uh, this year's CBA, we want to make it a, a little interactive and want to hear from all of you. So we will have two breakout uh, sessions and two speakers lined up. Uh, so uh, we will be going through the first breakout group, which is uh, the icebreaker group. Uh, you will be uh, split into 50 breakout groups automatically, uh, and it will take our, around a few time. Uh, our IT team will be handling it. And then we uh, aim is uh, to get to know each other uh, closely because uh, this is a virtual event. And normally in the opening plenaries, we don't get uh, time to talk with each other and build a network, talk about the LLA principles as well. So. Uh, each group will have like few people and then uh, what to do in the group will be, you will, you will have chance to introduce yourself. Uh, I request you to turn on your camera just to say hello as well. Each group will be seeing 20 pictures broadcasted in their group and uh, take a few moments to see the pictures and select uh, three or two pictures and summarize of what are your aspirations for locally uh, led adaptation principles and share your th thought with the group. Uh, also, we you can see in the CBA platform, we have pin board. So if you have like a very good uh, uh, aspiration and you want to share it to the wider group of CBA, you can go to the pin board in the CBA, uh, CBA webpage and then put your uh, aspiration as well over there. Uh, so the 20 pictures will be this, which will be broadcasted in your uh, screen on the breakout groups. Uh, but for getting an example of what aspiration is, uh, what aspiration you want to build on for such an example, I want to put uh, to Sam, if you want to share some aspiration through this picture as an example to our audience. Thanks, Sheila. So just to give you an idea, uh, I look at these 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 pictures, some of them more beautiful than others. Uh, and I think with LLA that for me, um, there is a, a nice vision in the distance, but it feels like it can be quite difficult to get there. Uh, and my aspirations is that we that we can travel that distance. So this picture in the top right, where you can see the sea is in the distance, but it looks like we have to get through a, a cave to get there. That's what I my aspirations is. So I think that one, I think the picture below it of the elephant, because it's grand and it's ambitious, and that picture speaks to me about ambition. Um, um, and, you know, maybe just to be a little bit corny, there is a, a, a nice picture of the sun rising over some, some rocks at the top. And it will take us a long time to get there, but I do hope that, you know, the sun will shine. We can be optimistic about adaptation. Uh, and what will what will happen in the future. So that's what speaks to me from these pictures, but I suspect that other people might take something very, very different and that's great. So I'm yeah. looking forward to hearing that. Thank sure. you. Thanks so much, Sam. <clears throat> the picture that I liked the most was the one, uh, the, the two boys are playing football and we also have a global goal on adaptation. So the goal has clicked me on that goal post. So we need to have that goal post, the goal to be posted on the goal with the young people uh, throughout. So that is one of the aspirations that I pick out from these pictures. So I request everyone to go to the breakout group. Uh, uh, Amy, are we ready with the breakout group? We are, I'm opening them right now. Um, it might just take 30 seconds for you to see the notification. 
so the rooms are open. You should all be automatically taken to your breakout rooms. Emma, can I ask you to share the screen to breakouts? Emma? Oh, great. Can I just double check with you, Emma, that that's sharing to breakouts as well as plenary? Yes, it is, yeah. Well, great, be. thank you. <laughs> A couple of people still here in the main room, Celia and Ibrahim. Are you having trouble getting into your breakout rooms?
for anyone else waiting in the main room, the breakout rooms are now closing. Uh, hello, everyone. We are waiting for people to get back from the breakout room. Just wait for a few seconds or minutes. I hope you have a good interaction, discussion, and discuss about your aspiration on locally led adaptation principles from these pictures. If you want to share this to all of these, because we were few on the groups, you can put it on the chat box or you can put it on the pin board we have on CBA uh, web platform. Uh, so we have now uh, Dr. Rosalind West, uh, she is the lead advisor on weather uh, and climate change, climate science at the UK Commonwealth and Development Office. She is a co-chair of the Adaptation Research Alliance, which is a global collaborative effort to increase investment and opportunities for action research to development, uh, develop and inform effective adaptation solutions. Rosalind, are you are you with us? Yeah, I'm here, Sushila. Yeah. Uh, so, Emmy, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. share the slide. Emma, do you uh, have Rosalind, ready? Rosalind, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's just fantastic to see so many people here today and I can really tell it's gonna be a fantastic conference. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. And I'm, I'm really sorry because the cat also wants to speak. <laughs> so I hope he'll stay down there. And thank you so much for the introduction. You know, I'm really pleased to be here and to represent the, the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. And of course the Adaptation Research Alliance, which we, we call the ARA and just for short. Um, so, yeah, on that, if you could um, show my slides, that would be really great. Thank you. So the, the Adaptation Research Alliance, as, as Sushila just said, is it's a global coalition that's really committed to action for adaptation research that strengthens resilience in communities that are most vulnerable to climate change. And I know that many of you work very closely um, in and with those communities. What's unique about this alliance is that its membership reflects the breadth of expertise right across the adaptation community from research right through to action. And we have over 150 members in the alliance now from six continents. These members are researchers, they're funders, they're policymakers, development bodies and community based organisations. And together that whole alliance works to bring to life a research enterprise that is really action oriented and which is helping to deliver both real and significant benefits to those that are at risk from climate change impacts. Now, achieving that, that change that we really want to see isn't going to happen by doing things the way that they've always been done. We know that we need a paradigm shift in how research is being done. And we also know that locally led action and locally led adaptation is a crucial element of that approach that we need for the whole system transformation. It's really fantastic to see how locally led adaptation has gained momentum. And this is in thanks and in no small part to partners and programs like IAED um, and like the Life AR initiative and all of those organizations that are represented here today and throughout um, the conference. You know, I really think that the work of all of these organizations is essential to shift the focus um, you know, from the top down really to that, to that bottom up locally led approach. 
and ensure that adaptation projects are being driven from the local level and by local priorities. Now on the next slide, um, I'd just like to um, talk about how we can do that coherently and effectively. One of the ways that we guide locally led adaptation is with frameworks and like IA, these principles for locally led adaptation that we were just talking about. Now, complementing these principles are another set of principles, the adaptation research for impact principles. These principles have been endorsed by all members of the Adaptation Research Alliance. There are a set of six guidelines for research design, for knowledge sharing and for outcome tracking to ensure a focus on equity and on action. So the, these six principles that you can see before you now are really aimed at supporting and influencing the activities, the plans, the programs and the policies of, of ARA members but they apply, of course, to the broader community of practice working on adaptation, action and research in general. These principles really align with the locally led adaptation principles and ensure we are guided by a common set of values and work towards shared goals as part of a collective vision of change. This is how that we will ensure that actions are based on real needs identified by those on the ground who are living with the impacts of climate change right now. These practitioners are already engaged in adaptation planning and action on the ground. Um, they're right at the forefront of tackling climate change you know, as we speak, and of course have invaluable knowledge to share with the researchers, both locally and more broadly. And I think this is really important um, aspect through the peer learning, both South-South and of course South-North collaboration. So that's just a quick whistle stop through those uh, six adaptation research for impact principles. I'd now like to um, look on the next slide um, about, uh, about the micro grants. So this is really grassroots action research. Um, so these principles not only ensure cohesive communities to practice, um, but can be really instrumental in shaping funding and ensuring that investments are successful in, in enabling more leadership at the local level. So the Adaptation Research Alliance, we use these principles to shape our um, first round of micro grants. These are very small scale grants of about 10,000 uh, British pounds focused on identifying burning issues in communities that research could help to meet. Now, the key thing for these um, micro grants was that the lead organisation had to be based in the global south and preference was given to grassroots and practitioner led collaborations bringing the focus onto action. The other key thing um, about these grants is that co-production approaches were very actively promoted and encouraged. Um, and they were all demand driven project ideas that really came from needs in the communities or from, uh, from national level priorities. Due to the short duration of these projects, three months, and uh, many of these built on past collaborations but also encouraged expanding to new transdisciplinary partnerships. Mobilising communities to discuss the adaptation challenges they are facing is really important to make sure that there's a deep and a shared understanding of the burning issues being faced. The projects, I mean, in that short time frame, those projects were not intended to solve those challenges, but to start or enrich the conversations and be a catalyst of bringing people together for further action. Now, none of those elements are, are necessarily innovative or even enough on their own, but we also know that there have not been enough adaptation projects that have taken those approaches. I mean, and this is especially true in the adaptation research space, which still tends to be dominated by, by Northern researchers, though this is changing. So being intentional about how we frame funding and really creating opportunities for locally led projects, how we engage with communities and co-design new new research programs is really essential if we want to generate sustainable and effective and evidence-based and locally led solutions. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Rosalind West. Uh, it was an interesting insight on how we are promoting uh, this grassroots action research and this is uh, I hope uh, all the participants is excited to uh, see uh, and learn uh, this from you. Uh, just let me share my screen as well. Okay, 
Uh, so uh, after hearing from Rosalind, we want to have a second breakout groups uh, today, uh, the second breakout group of today. So um, we will be splitting into the breakout groups again, and we are trying to have the same people uh, and an additional few new faces as well. Uh, so uh, in this session, we will be uh, talking about the big questions associated with uh, locally led adaptation. So each group will receive a link to the Jamboard and there are a few facilitators. We, we have uh, some facilitator with us and you can see their name with facilitators in the, uh, in the uh, 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 name as well. And they will help us uh, in the session uh, to run this session uh, together with you. A facilitator will post the Jamboard link in each group and each Jamboard have one question. So uh, you have to use the, the, the sticky notes or you can be creative and use the Google image search and make this uh, Jamboard uh, about like what you think and what is uh, to explore this. Uh, just to have a brief uh, idea, if you haven't used Jamboard before, uh, this is the slides that you will have. This is the example slide we have already on Jamboard and you can click this one to go to the next slide. You can use the pen feature over here uh, uh, from the Jamboard. Uh, there is a stick, sticky note options as well to be used. And you can use the Google image search and have uh, icons or pictures uh, relevant to what you want to explain through a picture as well. And uh, so for example, we have, how can we mobilize climate finance for adaptation? So you can think about what you want to write through a pen or a sticky note or a Google image. And we are expecting to have something like this at the end. So make pictures, uh, icons, uh, sticky notes, or pen, and uh, have, the, have a, a rich discussion, have a discussion around this topic. You have a facilitator on the room, and then uh, we will come back from the breakout and share our experience on locally led adaptation into practice. Uh, I invite everyone to join the breakout group. Amy, are we ready with the breakout group? Yes, we are. I'm opening them now. Yeah. Hi, Amy. I am a facilitator, um, but I don't have the. Uh, oh no! I, I it's it's appeared now. Sorry. Thank you. No problem.
Uh, Amy, can you put me in the next group, please? Hi, Ritu, you should be able to choose the group yourself, um, but I can put it in for you. How do I do that? Can you tell me, were you just in number 11? I was in 10. Okay, I will put you into 11 now. But how do you choose? Um, change so if you go down to breakout rooms on the toolbar. Okay, it okay, give you it. okay. Okay, so I go into room number 11, no, room number 10. I was already in room number 10 now, but there's a facilitator Aaron there. Yeah, so your number's 11 and 12. 11 and 12. But in 11, we have facilitator Aaron. I was in facilitator uh, room number 10. With okay, Rock. can you go to 12? Okay. Uh, Amy, there is already a facilitator there. Um, My other room that I was supposed to join is uh, uh, Climate Information Service because I was just in migration and I don't know. Okay. Hey, I'm having a bit of trouble here. People, uh, people have keep. I keep on going into the groups I'm supposed to be in, but other people have already put Jamboards yes. in them. <laughs> yeah, same, same problem with me. I don't know which Jamboard to place there. Okay, I think people have maybe just gone into the wrong rooms. <laughs> um, so well, I, was, I, will... I was assigned to one initially, which was the wrong one for me. So that's, that's I think, maybe part of the confusion is, is, is that. But then I just went into the one which I'm, I'm listed as being supposed to do and someone else was already had already been in. Okay, let me just... Um... Room number seven has no facilitator. Okay, can I put one of you into seven then? Okay, you can put John there. Because John was before me <laughs> in the list of facilitator. Then I see eight has facilitator. But the problem is, Ritu, that, that because people are jumping between the two, I went into an empty one, but someone had already oh, been in. Okay. Jonathan Barnes, room number nine, facilitator five has not joined. So it's room number nine. Nine. Okay, I'll try and join nine now. Thank you. Room number room? 12. Okay, I'm joining room number 12 now. No, I've already been into nine. I've already been into nine and sent away. <laughs> Hey, Amy. Hello. Hey. Yeah, um, I've, I've already been into room number nine and told that was one of my original groups and they've already been given a jam board by somebody else. I don't know how to go about finding one to join. Yeah, let me just message the group and see if anybody knows um, okay. where they're waiting for somebody. Jonathan, I can't see a facilitator in room two. Um, room four has one, room six has
So yeah, both the groups I was supposed to do have already been given Jamboards. Okay, bear with me, Jonathan. Have we got 20 still or have we lost a few? <laughs> so one room seems to now have um, lost a couple. So we are on 19 rooms. Okay. Yeah, hi. So uh, we've just come out of one of the rooms because there wasn't anything um, happening. There were three of us in that room, but we, we didn't see a link or any kind of um, communication. So we've just come out of it. Thank you, Chris. I can put you into another room. I think that um, a couple of people have dropped off. Right. I think there was three of us in our room. OK, I can join that one, Amy. Thank you. Was that room five? Uh, I've no idea. There's no number. Um, okay, if I could ask you, Jonathan, to join room eight, it looks like there's only two people in there. Um, and okay, Chris... we'll do it. Um, you know, the guys and roommates have all got the jam board already going. Okay. Um, let's see. I haven't heard of any rooms that need a jam board now. Maybe, maybe everyone's got one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just ask on the WhatsApp again. Hello, Ami. Is it possible they have jam boards but not? Facilitators? Hello. 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 Amy. Hello. Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, you know, I, uh, my power, uh, I mean, my internet got interrupted, so I went out, but uh, Mr. Biniam Gabriuses was uh, actually transferring me from one group to another group because I was in a group that discussed about drug policy, which I am not fully aware of. So I wanted to be moved to another group. And now suddenly because of the internet uh, disruption, I came out and when I come in, I'm in the, I mean, uh, maybe I'm in the lobby, I'm not sure. Could you please transfer me to some group? Yeah, so we did close that group because everyone in the group wanted to be moved. Um, so yeah. we've closed that drugs group. So I can add you to another group. Um, yes, please. So you should be able to choose it yourself if you go down to breakout rooms. You should see an option to join a room. Okay. Uh, any room is okay, yeah? I think, yeah. I think everyone has jam boards at least at this point, um, but I can see room eight, uh, room 17 doesn't have a facilitator, so you could go there. Uh, well, let me go to room seven and see and join the group, yeah? Thank you. Sorry, Amy, so you think room 17, I should have a go joining? Um, it looks like there's no facilitator there, so um, that would be helpful. Okay. Thank you.
being recorded. Welcome back from the plenary. Uh, we are still uh, waiting for the people to join back from the plenary because there is still some few minutes left. Uh, please be with us and we will have another speaker with us uh, after this uh, breakout group uh, is back. recorded. Uh, welcome back from the plenary. So uh, we have our second speaker with us, uh, Rene Van Hel. Uh, Rene is the director of inclusive green growth in Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. And uh, I think he has already joined us, uh, Rene. Yes, I'm uh, here, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the CDA conference, and the floor is yours, Rene. Yes, thank you so much. Um, my, my name is indeed Rene van Hel. I'm the director for Inclusive Green Growth, and I think that uh, that matches very well what we're discussing today. Um, I'm really glad that you invited me to participate in the opening session of already the 16th conference on community based adaptation. And um, it's a pleasure to be among a community of practitioners who first met to discuss the topic 17 years already ago. And um, you were ahead of the times when you began and you're an important platform now that adaptation has become rightfully so much more part of the regular discourse. And what, what my main job is, is trying to work with or many, many, many organizations in the South in order to lift people out of poverty by promoting sustainable growth in LDCs. So our focus is really Africa and especially in Africa, the poor, the poor countries in Africa. Um, therefore, we attach such importance to climate change adaptation. The impacts of climate change are felt throughout the world, but we all know that the effects of droughts are, are felt most, most in the poorest countries. Um, but in a way, what you, we also see that, 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 that climate change is, is affecting everyone everywhere else. And that's where I hope the, the, the and that's where I hope that the worldwide consensus and community comes from because we need much more money. We need we need to do much more. And the fact that it affects everybody is 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 in a way uh, for all those in Africa perhaps a bit of a blessing in disguise. Um, but we feel it's urgent to support countries and vulnerable communities to adapt to these changes and increase resilience. So our aim is to spend the majority of our climate finance on adaptation and we will advocate for more climate change, climate finance in general. And of course, in, we also advocate improving the balance between mitigation and adaptation. And that's what we will do in Sharm El Sheikh at the COP27. We all know that for climate adaptation to be effective, local ownership over analysis, design and implementation is crucial. 
And in recognition of this, we signed the LA, LLA principles last year. At the coming COP, we also support a number of LLA events, just to underline how enthusiastic we are. Um, we also realized that while the LLA principles are new, the underlining concepts are not. They bring together the importance of good participation and good adaptation. And I think it's important to keep the focus on doing LLA well, and not to get lost in terminology. Let's just be practical and not just um, ha have biblical discussions about ter terminology. Um, I, I, I have to be a little bit modest because the Netherlands is a relatively new kid on the block when it comes to LLA. And we are therefore still very much developing programs and we do not claim to be a leader. However, we participated in a couple of inspiring examples that I would like to share with you. In Burundi, the DRC and Uganda, we are financing several programs that followed the so-called Plan Intégré du Paysan, the PAP, PIP approach or integrated farm plan. In this approach, households are encouraged to develop their own vision for the future of their farm, and then to develop joint plans with their communities for the landscape that they live in. This leads to increased diversification and resilience at household and landscape level. Secondly, in Rwanda, a pilot project aimed at introducing a community-led approach for landscape restoration is adopted as national policy by the government which has allocated substantial resources to implement this countrywide. And thirdly, in Ethiopia, the dry dev project is an example of farmer managed natural regeneration. An example in which farmers are responsible for managing trees in and around their fields. And in this landscape restoration project, 50,000 hectares degraded arid land have now been restored and water supply was improved. Women benefited by reducing time to fetch water and strengthening their livelihoods through so-called village savings and loan programs and value chain development. This project uh, won the Energy Globe Award in 2021. And as we all know, this, 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 this award is, is a rather prestigious international sustainability award. Going on to the fourth example in Beira, Mozambique, the Netherlands engages in a long-term partnership that supports the city to become more climate resilient against climate shocks. So especially floods and cyclones, because that is really what Baira in Mozambique is suffering from. And based on the development master plan in 2012, the collaboration has now grown organically over the past nine years. What was relevant in this collaboration um, is that it has been reconfirmed in 2019 when cyclone Idai devastated much of the city. And what we're trying to do is to support stronger municipal institutions, more local revenue collection, taxation, and better service delivery. Um, we're also supporting the expansion of infrastructure and disaster preparedness. And moreover, uh, we, we, we support the city's efforts to promote coordination between donors and with central government, because that donor coordination and coordination within the government is of course oftentimes also an, an issue. Wrapping up, the last thing I want to say is, an, is that uh, the, the Netherlands co-hosts the UN Water Conference in March next year. And my wish is that water will in future just be treated like energy or any other, uh, uh, any other resource. The problem is that water oftentimes is not treated well. And why is that? The politics are wrong and the, and the economics are wrong. The politics are wrong because it's not the right kind of ministers who decide in the end how to allocate water. And the politics and the economics are wrong because we do not value water properly. And since we're not valuing water properly, we're using it too much, we're, and, 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 which leads to, and, and, we're, and we're mismanaging it. So please also join us for the UN Water Conference in order to get the politics and the economics of water well. And that locally led adaptation is also a central uh, element of, of a better managed water as a resource, as a resource for sustainable development. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for allowing me to, to, to say a few words to you. And I look forward to meeting many of you in Sharm El Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rene. Thank you for, uh, we're so happy to hear from the government of Netherlands and your support and commitment for the locally led adaptation. 
uh, and building it towards the uh, conference on water and as you mentioned the political and economic part of not just water but all about the climate change and climate action and enhancing locally led action uh, to support this initiative thank you so much for this you're welcome uh, now uh, just let me share the slide one more time uh, okay so uh, we have the time to to our facilitators to make this Jamboard a little bit uh, creative, a little bit organize the Jamboards. So if we have somebody from the facilitators who want to share their themes and the Jamboard, uh, you are much welcome to do that. Uh, anyone who, want, who had an interesting session on your group want to share back, uh, we are open for this feedback. I can share from my group, so share yeah, that. Yeah, sure. Uh, I don't know if I can share my screen while you're sharing yours, but maybe okay, I can just I give can you a... stop it. Okay. Yeah. So let me see if I can share. Now, we didn't get many pictures on our Jamboard. Um, and of course, now you're asking me, it's quite hard to find it. Um, here we go. So we had a question about conflict. Um, now, as I said, we didn't get many pictures, but we did come to quite an interesting conclusion, which I think is important to reach in the opening plenary, which is that applying the locally led adaptation principles in a conflict risk area it might look quite different to elsewhere. Uh, there might be some things that you want to prioritize over others. Uh, however, what we did recognize is that understanding climate risk for all parties within that area is going to be important, particularly if you're working across a landscape. In that landscape, you might have different parties in a conflict, but all of them need to recognize that there is a, a, a climate risk um, and that that's something that might shape your approach in trying to deal with the issue. We also talked about funding. How does flexible programming and learning combine with the need for patient and predictable funding in a context which is unpredictable where you don't quite know what you're going to be doing with the funding. So it was a really interesting uh, discussion to just begin opening up some of the issues. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to share some of those thoughts. Uh, thank you, Sam. Do we have any other facilitators who want to share what they discuss? in their group if they don't have a creative uh, jam board as well. Hey, Sheila, I think Chris is happy to share from um, group okay. one. Chris. It's been a while since I've used and shared. So I can share screen, which is share screen. There. <clears throat> share. I hope that works. So, um, yeah, in a, what, what do we want to say? The yellow are the problems um, and the green are things we can do about it. Um, I think Claire was strong on the platforms and like host society approach and so on. And I guess getting the governance right for which LLA I think can obviously help. It, it's hard for communities to access funds, but this a whole society approach or having a good platform would do it. I think we identified um, the need for um, a policy framework that actually works for adaptation because sometimes that isn't in place because there is a mitigation bias. Um, and maybe that comes from a lack of evidence. So maybe those ones on the top should be joined up. There's one point I would want to make, um, which I think is really important for everyone. And that is we need business that actually works is viable so it is business it's not um pseudo business it's real business so it works for those who are investing in it but um it that also works for the environment and also works for people this at uh, like a triple win that would be green business if we really had green business and without that uh, i think the fear is that there are there is a a, a trend or a tide working against us when you've got business that actually is maladapt 
leads to maladaptation. And I think we've got to engage in that. That's my personal view. Other than that, I think, I uh, hope you like the one or two pictures we managed to put in the slide. Hats off to Claire on getting those in. Thanks. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, other facilitators, uh, somebody want to join on? I can share from one of our groups. Uh, that's yeah. yeah, sure, please. If I see money to share. Yeah, so from group 15, I was talking of the role of nature based solutions in supporting uh, LLA, the LLA principles. And uh, so we were, uh, the group was focusing on how indigenous knowledge is very important. And so using the nature based solutions, but also, also anchoring, bringing in fact, the issues of indigenous knowledge. And uh, we they discussed that uh, nature based solution is also very key, for example, to av avoiding using other materials from outside, but using things that are totally uh, locally and uh, getting that can be got from, from, from the areas. And uh, so, and also using uh, nature based solutions is effective in a way that it attracts finances from outside and uh, also having uh, core, core benefits in the adaptation to climate change. And uh, we also know that uh, people live very close to, to nature and they interact with nature every time. So like nature is part of the society and society is part of nature. So it's inseparable. So nature-based solution should be key in driving, um, driving, driving the LLA principles. And also if we are talking about adaptation, so we cannot do away with the na na nature. So nature has to be there integrating. And uh, if we use nature, we, like I say, we are going to, do the say plant trees or do something, but also we are strengthening biodiversity. There are core benefits there, strengthening biodiversity, soil health, uh, sustainable food production, also working with nature rather than against it. And um, we, if you're using nature-based solutions, the, the role of nature-based solution also is to make, we ensure that people who are more uh, interact more with nature, in, especially in certain countries with our women, children, and girls, uh, tech lead in the adaptation in supporting climate change adaptation. So, if you look at our two pictures, three pictures here, you try to see trying to use uh, greening and nature to promote climate change adaptation. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, thank you, everyone, for this exciting uh, discussion uh, interaction and hope you like our uh, new way of uh, starting the opening plenary with a lot of discussions. This was an experiment and we hope uh, you were happy about this experiment as well. So as I shared in the, uh, in the opening, so this is the time to grab your pen and the paper. So I hope you all have pen and paper with you. So what we will be doing, we'll be grabbing a pen and paper and writing a single word that is your aspiration for LLA, what you think about LLA, what you want to write, a single word, and we will open all our cameras and show it to uh, the screen so that we have a very good opening plenary picture with us. Showing, uh, showing this, our word. So let's grab the pen and paper and let's write the word and then we can show it to the screen. And Amy can support us if it's visible or not. Oh, it's opposite for me. Yeah, hold them up as close as possible, please.
So thank you everyone. And I would like to pass it to Sam for closing it out. Thanks to Sheila. I don't have that much to add. Uh, just to say thank you to everybody for joining the opening plenary. Um, do keep an eye out for announcements on the live blog. And also uh, you will find a discussion area uh, on the platform where we'll also be posting some interesting new opportunities, some resources, uh, interesting funding opportunities that have come available and that is the place to find out about them uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to a good conference with you and uh, hopefully you'll join us at the closing plenary tomorrow where we'll be trying to pull together all of the messages from the sessions that you attend uh, uh, over the next couple of days so don't miss that because we will need you so that we can pull together what it is the CBA community thinks about locally led adaptation uh, and there'll be a, a fascinating panel discussion reflecting on that as well. So enjoy the conference. Thank you for joining. Looking forward to speaking to you over the next couple of days. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Storytile colleagues, please.